Welcome friends, Family Health with Dr. Lex. I am totally fangirling. You can see I'm kind of sweating a little bit. I'm all dressed up to go to a benefit for women who are going through cancer. And it is apropos that my guest who I have been following her career and admiring her from a distance for the longest time. She's a fellow NICOM graduate, board certified emergency medicine, founder, creator, coach, super mom of five kids and two sets of twins. She's a wife. She does it all beautifully, gracefully. Dr. Hala Sabri, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so pumped. I'm so excited to be here. I finally got asked to be on your show and I was like super excited about it. <laughs> so, so Hala and I both from trained in New York at the New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine. She's a little younger than me. She's one year behind me um, in graduation, but we come from similar roots. I, this is the person I was telling you, you're the person that I'm, I mean, we know that person that you look up to that you say, if I ever get a chance to meet that person, you know, in your field or like, you know, somebody that runs in the same circles. I said, if I ever get a chance to meet her, I know we're just gonna have so much in common, have so much to talk about. And so when I, I asked and reached out and asked for uh, podcast guests, you were kind enough to join. And I'm really thrilled that your topic is so specific and so interesting that I think it's really going to touch and reach a lot of women, um, it's gonna be valuable information. Today, we're gonna to talk about why you underwent a prophylactic mastectomy, right? Yeah, and actually this is the first time I'm ever talking about it on anything besides my Facebook page um, and TikTok. So thank you for even giving me the platform. So thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I think it's really important to amplify your voice with respect to this because it's not something that's commonly done or recommended or, even talked about. And so, you know, um, having gone through, uh, my mother as well went through ovarian cancer. She passed 12 years ago. I know your mom passed at a young age as well um, from cancer. And there's so much talk and education out there about cancer. And yet there's not really as much talk about the genetic component and what we can do to change our legacy. We're going to talk about the word that you use, legacy. Um, so tell me about your mom, first of all. Tell me her name so that we can all say it out loud and, oh and good things into the world for her. I know we're going to get a little, a little mushy. I know. <laughs> I'm already starting to well up. Uh, so her name is Noha and she, you know, it's, I, I think it's interesting. My, my dad actually passed away when I started medical school. He started, he passed away three weeks into my medical school career. And I think I was just so busy in the grind that I was like, I just, I just got to get through it, you know, but I think with my mom passing, it's a little different. First of all, your mom is different than your dad. Not that they're better or worse. It's just different. Um, I was very, very, very close to my dad. In fact, I was like a daddy's girl, but I think with my mom, I think, you know, having both of your parents gone, it's a little bit different. And then it's just like that. My dad was like known for his legacy of his career. And he, he was an emergency medicine physician as well. And I think with my mom, she was a homemaker. And so for me, like, I think I struggled a lot, especially with all of the accomplishments I've had really from her saying, Hey, like, you know, you know do, do, do all the do things, all the things. Like, like, don't, I mean, not, not being a homemaker is not easy at all, but yeah. she's like, you know, just go out there and make your impact that you want, you know, with that, with your children at home and beyond. And so for me, I get like a little bit worried that her name or her legacy will actually be forgotten so you just asked me what her name is like so like it brought up a lot of emotion but um but yeah she um so she got diagnosed with her first lesion when she was 49 I was a intern so I had already graduated medical school and I remember the call uh it was like super scary she had a lumpectomy and then a couple of years later they found out that she had a recurrent mass same side um that was missed on mammogram um, and we could talk about why that was. And, 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 and it was kind of, I mean, sometimes we just miss things and sometimes, you know, there's things that she probably could have done to increase the yeah. chances of them not missing it. Um, and then, um, so she had a mastectomy and that was, you know, a few years later, right before I had my first child. And then when I was pregnant with my last pregnancy, right before I got pregnant, she had recurrence again. And um, she unfortunately passed away three months after that. And so it's been, you know, kind of part of my life for a long time, but her dying wish, um, and I don't say that just like a, you know, as a, you know, kind of symbolic thing. She actually literally told me like my wish for you as I die. And she died a month later was that you, you will complete a prophylactic mastectomy. 
And so here I am four years later and yesterday was her birthday and she actually died on her birthday. So that's like really like surreal. Um, so yesterday was a four year anniversary for her. And um, this is the first year and I was telling you this before we started taping, this is the first year I'm okay. And I think I just completed that part of her, uh, the promise <laughs> that I made to her. And then also like, I'm sharing why, and I'm sharing that promise I had with her. And I, and I think that, and I'm hoping that this will be her legacy of saving so many lives, even though we couldn't save hers. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, I have chills, you know, you speak about your dad and how he influenced your career. And my situation is mm -hmm. similar. You know, my dad's an intensivist and pulmonologist, and um, I'm very close with him as well. And great relationship, of course, but you're right. There's something special about your mom. And there's something about special about the fact that your mom you know, told you that you could be everything and do everything. You could have it all and do it with grace and ease. You're a unifier of people. You've created a the largest, right? The largest Facebook group out mm -hmm. there, 116,000. Oh, no. no, it's not the largest Facebook group, but probably for women physicians it is, but not definitely not the largest in the world. Yeah. So you, you are, you are, you know, ex taking her, um, wisdom and inspiration and everything good that she gave to you and you are pushing it out into the world exponentially um and she you're right she she lives in you through you and her um her story her name and her situation is going to serve to educate so many people and help so many people who might not even be aware that this is an option or that this is you know something that they should look into so i'm really excited to amplify this story and um and just kind of, you know, provide a point of resource, point of reference for people to look for someone else who has gone through it, you know, who is who has done through it, who's kind of gone through the mental game. Uh, you know, I'm sure you were a little bit torn about fulfilling your mom's wish for you and, you know, making decisions over your own body. So let's talk about that for a second. Um, first of all, why is a prophylactic mastectomy? Why was it indicated for you? Your mom had breast cancer and we know um, some breast cancers are genetic, but why in your instance, was it even an option for you? And is it an option for everyone who's, whose relative has, um, has cancer? Yeah. Um, so I'm not a breast surgeon. I'm an emergency medicine physician. So I just want to preface with that. So um, why was it an option for me? Well, my mom was not the only person who died of breast cancer in our family. Um, my mom, she obviously died of breast cancer her mom had breast cancer at the age of 55, but did not die of breast cancer. And then she also had two maternal aunts, my grandmother's sisters. One of them died by the age of 44 from breast cancer, but that was in the seventies. And then the other one just had a unilateral mastectomy a couple of years ago at the age of 75 and she's still alive. And so um, there's a lot of people on my maternal side that have breast cancer. And so when my mom was telling me like, Hey, you know, her exact words was were I don't, you know, I know I'm not, I'm not a doctor, but I don't think you have to be one to realize with all of the women in our family on my mother's lineage, um, that something, uh, it causes our breast cancer. So even if they, if the genetic testing comes back negative, that just means that they haven't discovered the gene yet. And so, um, and so this conversation happened after I actually went and got genetic testing that day. I happened to actually be speaking at an event and one of the sponsors was color genomics. And so I was like, Oh, what is this? And so I said, well, you know, my mom is battling breast cancer and it's something I really want to know, but my mom had negative BRCA. So at that point, I just thought that I, that I was okay. Cause she was negative and then I would be a negative probably too. But then they were like, well, there's a lot more genes than just BRCA. And I was like, what, like, what is that? So I took the test. Um, and then found out that I was positive for a gene called check two. So anybody could take the test. So color genomics, I do, I'm not sponsored or affiliated with any of these companies. I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, but I wish I was because I think that they are doing amazing work, uh, but color genomics and in And I think there's a third one that I don't know of, um, but that, that's really respected amongst the geneticist world. Um, but you can go on their websites and you can order your own genetic test. And so I know there's probably lots of doctors listening to this and cringing like, oh my God, they're going to get these results and not know what to do with it. But I think, you know, be smart about it. I mean, obviously you could have a lot of different markers that come back positive, but it's just because you have the gene for something doesn't mean you're going to get that disease. It's just that you're predisposed. So for someone like me that has a lot of breast cancer in my family, at least my primary family members, meaning my mom, dad, sister, brother, um, I have a little bit of likelihood that I may be exposed to that. So when I did my testing with color genomics, it came back positive for check two. 
And when I got the call, I was like, what the heck is check two? Like I did not learn about that in medical school um, or you know, I don't remember that at all. It wasn't on any of my board exams. And so the genesis was really sweet, went through all of the testing, you know, all of the reasons that check two could be a little bit dangerous. And basically, um, and by the time this airs and by the time anyone's seeing this, they may have found more about check two, but basically I have a higher risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, and thyroid cancer if I have a primary family member or a medical history that's concerning for it. And so I got that information in March um, of 2018, a week after my mom passed away. And um, we're taping this March of 2022. So like what happened in that four years? Well, there was a lot of confusion. What do I do next? And am I, am I a candidate for prophylactic mastectomy? So all I knew at that point was I had an increased risk And then the recommendations were get your colonoscopy um, starting now and then every three or five years, depending on the situation. And then start, I was already doing mammograms, but now I had to do dual imaging. So a mammogram every year and an MRI every year. So every six months I was going for, um, for some testing. And that was kind of the recommendation at that point. You know, and on this show, we talk a lot about lifestyle and we always say kind of the opposite of what you're saying, not that, you know, not that it's contradictory, but that genetic only plays so much of a role in our life, in our life, in our medical, um, you know, uh, trajectory, you know, the, how, how our health care goes and what conditions we develop. And we'll say for a lot of things like heart disease and some cancers and, uh, you know, diabetes and obesity, things like that, that we have a lot more control than we previously thought. We thought genetic, we used to think genetics played a, a much larger role in some of those diseases. Whereas what it really boiled down to is that our parents and generations before us really kind of lived a much different lifestyle than we do now. And we coach patients and teach patients that, you know, if you live a healthy lifestyle for many things, you do not have to follow genetically in your parents' footsteps. But these are conditions where, that we're talking about that are proven to have some, to confer some increased risk of something, whether it's breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, and a lot of them confer increased risk for multiple things. So the BRCA gene we talked about, my mother passed from ovarian cancer and she struggled with that for five years before she passed. She was BRCA negative. And with that information, that means that I am, at, um, you know, I am not technically at any increased risk for the, thing, the cancers that are associated with BRCA, ovarian, pancreatic, breast. And so um, I had a long discussion with my gynecologist about mm-hmm. after that about what should my individual screening be? Because I know that one test is negative, but I also know that I have you know, this family history. And so together with my doctor, we were able to decide based on the information that we had, what was the appropriate screening. And we decided to do pelvic ultrasounds periodically alternating with pelvic exams because there really isn't a great test for Mm -hmm. screening test for ovarian cancer, as well as of course, uh, breast exams, regular mammography and things like that. So it just brings up a great point that, you know, on one hand, you do have some control over the trajectory of your health going forward. But on the other hand, having this information can really be helpful to make decisions, you know, to kind of figure out not only what your options are, you know, surgically in your case, but what should your screening be if it should be anything different than the standard? Yeah. And I, and I, I agree with everything you said, so I don't know if I'm really saying anything opposite, but I do think that if anything, I probably have even more risk. This is my thought with lifestyle. I mean, I'm sure I'm eating tons of foods that probably increase my chances of having increased estrogen in my body. I'm a, I'm more overweight than my mom ever was. Um, mm. I've had more fluctuations with pregnancy, although pregnancy does have some, you know, some protective barrier for it, but sometimes it doesn't, right? And so with hormone positive, and so I think I think you're exactly right. So I don't want everyone to go out and get genetic testing because I, you know, I mentioned it. Um, But I do think for people who have higher risk, like you have like a type of uh, diagnosis that's in your family, that's very, very common. And you're seeing that it's affecting multiple family members. I think it's just a tool, you know, Um, you know, I mean, I could find out, you know, in a couple of years that maybe, you know, I have a different genetic disease that, you know, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I think it's just a tool of knowing the, what their screening is. So I could have literally for the rest of my life done dual screenings of MRI and mammogram and been completely fine. Um, there's no, there's no, I mean, we don't have a, 
crystal ball to say that I would have gotten cancer. You know what I mean? So this is all just risk assessment. And we all do this every single day, like risk on, you know, everything that we do. And this is just like a primitive thing that we do. So for me, I mean, I think I had a little bit more, um, I don't know, more leaning on, you know, on doing the prophylactic mastectomy. And it was more of an emotional decision because of the discussion I had with my mom. But when I got the reports back and I found out that I would have, according to my family, my family history, they said that I would have a 44% chance risk of having breast cancer in the future. Um, I don't know exactly how that's calculated, but there's two different people who did the calculation and they came back 143 and one of those 44%. Uh, I, it was just too high for me. You know, um, I know that you mentioned in the intro that I have five kids, uh, but my five kids are, I mean, first of all, it doesn't matter how old they are, but they're young. I have um, three-year-old twins. I have seven-year-old twins and I have an eight-year-old. And so these, these kids are really young. So for me, I really had to make this decision, you know, is this, um, is this the right thing for my family? I had a lot of conversations with my husband about this um, and you know, did a lot of coaching. I hired a body image coach, really discussed a lot of that stuff and we could definitely delve into that. But ultimately I knew it was the right decision for me because I did not think, um, even without the test, even without the check two positive, I didn't think like if I ever got cancer, it was like when I was gonna get breast cancer. And so it was just so real for me. And I've lived through two generations of breast cancer showing up in my family and remembering it, you know? And so my mom, my grandma had breast cancer when I was 16, you know, and I remember those discussions, you know? Um, and so, and so for me, it was, it was an obvious choice for me, but, you know, I'll tell you that there aren't a lot of resources for women like me. And I am, I think probably one of the most well-connected people in the medical world. Um, and I'll tell you, once I got that test, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do with it. I was yeah. like, now what? Right. And so I think that's why I really want to tell my story um, is because I'm pretty sure there's a lot of women that are like, now what? I think once you have a lesion, once you get diagnosed with cancer, we, we have a lot of algorithms. We have a lot of uh, resources for women. Um, and, and you're kind of in survival mode at that time. I think just from speaking from my mom's, you know, experience and from a lot of people that I talk to, like there is a right way to deal with things. You know, you might have one or two options, but there's a path you're going to go down. But for me, that was like, well, what do you want to do? You know, and I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, wh what should I do? Just like you, like, you know, you're like, well, what should I be doing? Should I be doing ulcer challenge? What should I be doing pelvic exams? What should I be doing? And so then you get to decide and create your own future for yourself. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how, you know, kind of your advice for, because this is kind of, genetic testing is not standard of care for no. people who do not have a strong family history. You know, for example, I was eligible for it because I had a family history. Um, however, because my mom tested negative, my insurance wouldn't cover me for BRCA testing at the time because they consider if she's negative, then my risk is too low for them to pay for the test. Things may have changed since then. That was 2000, you know, 2007 that we're talking. But, um, you know, when we're, when, if you have a concern, if you're sitting there listening and thinking to yourself, well, I have multiple family members who have breast cancer, or have had colon cancer, um, you know, or even, you know, other conditions like, um, like thyroid cancer or uh, pancreatic, um, and thinking how, where would I even go or start to have the conversation about whether or not I qualify for genetic testing, whether or not it would be covered, and then what to do with those results. I mean, did you consult with your primary care doctor or who did you talk to about how you were going to use these results? Yeah, I think I talked to a lot of people, um, not only people who were directly involved with my care, my primary care physician, who was very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my OBGYN um, who was very supportive. Um, and those were the main two people I started conversations with. Um, actually, that's not actually the first two people. Let me tell you the first person I actually talked to. It was my breast radiologist. And people usually don't meet your breast radiologist, okay? Usually you go for your mammogram and then you get a letter in the mail, you know, sometime later. Um, but my breast radiologist was my study buddy from college. And he, um, you know, shout out to Dr. Ali Ismaili. He's like super amazing. Always been one of the smartest people I've ever known. And when my mom had recurrence the third time, I called him because I didn't know what to do and she needed a biopsy and he got her in the next day and he helped me. Um, and unfortunately she passed away, you know, a couple of months later, 
But, um, you know, he and I have always, you know, kind of kept in touch with that. And he has told me before, even when she passed away. So I was pregnant when she died. So there was nothing I could do at that moment. But he told me, hey, when you're done being pregnant, like we need to get you in. We need to make sure you're getting your, your imaging, which I already was doing. It's just that when I was pregnant, I couldn't do it. And he was like, you know, I want you to send me your images. I really want to like make sure that you're taken care of. And so once I was not pregnant and I was able to do my mammogram, I went to him, got my first MRI, went to him. Um, and every single time he would read my results, I mean, he would read them that night and he would say, Hey, they're negative, but what are we, what are we going to do about this? Yeah. And I was like, what do you, what do you mean? And you know, that anxiety, the imaging anxiety, um, of going every six months, it's like, you're almost like living your life only six months at a time yes. because you have to remember you guys, like I didn't think if I was going to get cancer, I just knew it was going to happen at some point. It's just a sixth sense I had, you know, it's happened to almost every woman, you know, in my lineage, you know? Um, and so, and so, yeah, so I, I, you know, he started that conversation and finally after two or three conversations like that, I was like, well, you know, to tell you the truth, I don't even know where to start. Um, and that's really embarrassing. I'm a doctor. I'm the most well-connected doctor I know. Like, oh, oh, how do I not know where to start? But I was just terrified. And he was like, okay, well, if you were my wife, this is who I would, you know, send you to because he reads a lot of imaging for a lot of different breast surgeons. And and then I started like Googling, you know, literally Googling, you know, like different breast surgeons. And I started consulting as many breast surgeons that I, as I wanted. And I think I consulted like probably a dozen um, wow. of, between breast surgeons and plastic surgeons. And just, it was so much information, but I, to tell you it's not actually that hard I, I think we make it harder on ourselves as, as women to make the perfect choice but also there's not really good resources out there so really one are you going to have a mastectomy yes or no and we could debate that all day if you should be having that but you know usually it's genetic risk and and you you'll get your recommendation from your from your geneticist and, and whatnot um so are you going to have a mastectomy and what is that going to look like are you going to have a bilateral mastectomy are you going to keep your nipples or not and these are things that you're going to discuss with your breast surgeon and then two what is your reconstruction plan are you going to go flat are you going to have reconstruction with implants or are you going to have re reconstruction with a deep flap like i did um and that's it but even though I could say that in 30 seconds, like that took me three years, you guys, three years to figure this out. Like that is so insane that we have such barriers to education, some simple education um, for, for patients. And if I couldn't figure it out, then I don't expect that, you know, our patients that are non-medical to figure it out. You bring up a great point about breast radiologists. They are a tremendous resource. I mean, it's nice to have a you know super specialist uh, on speed dial, but you know those are people that you can access that you can ask questions of that do just this. You know, usually breast radiologists specialize. They have additional special training to be able to read and identify um, and help you come up with a plan for your, for your screening. But it sounds like to me your plan, your team that kind of helped you make the decision. You know, family practice physician, OBGYN who were on board. It sounded like there was a geneticist and, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, breast radiologist and breast surgeon. So these are all people that you could speak to, to kind of get a sense of what, you know, what your risk is, number one, and then what to do with that risk. And, you know, you mentioned that it took four years to kind of come to a definitive, you know, from, from the thought of it to actually having gone through it. And um, anxiety comes in, and this is not just specific to breast surgery. This is specific to anything where, you know, you can see, you, you can um, have a chronic condition or um, something that you are following, that you are tr tracking, you know, tracking the progress of. And so when it comes to the, the risk and benefit, you have to take into consideration how much that anxiety component affects your life, because like you said, you could go for the rest of your life with screenings every six months or, and have it come up anyway, or you could have gone with a definitive procedure like you did, which was drastic. I mean, it's no, no joke. This is not a simple procedure here. Um, when we say prophylactic mastectomy, we mean that you had both of your natural breasts removed. And so the, you know, that was a definitive procedure that ideally eliminates your risk of breast cancer probably not to 0%, but pr probably significantly enough reduces your risk mm -hmm. of developing breast cancer down the road. And then of course, de diminishes or reduces or eliminates that anxiety component. And that's such a big, big piece of who we are and how we function every day 
that has to, had to be a big part of your decision. It had to be part of, you know, your thought process for what this meant if you were to pursue the definitive treatment for your mindset. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I had consulted, I, I think, I mean, I was so anxious. I consult, I mean, I don't think it's typical for someone to consult 12 surgeons, right? But I mean, in my world, I think that's normal. So I think, um, but you know, it's funny because not, there was no, a surgeon that said something different. Every surgeon that I met was like, take off your breasts, you know? Um, it's it's not worth it, right? It's not worth that, that high of risk. And so, um, and so for me, I don't know if I was looking for that one person that would be like, hey, actually, you, te you technically don't need to do it. I don't know what I was looking for exactly. I think I was just so scared and I wanted information and I wanted to make sure I was making the right decision. And so, um, yeah, so I think that you're going to be, I think anxiety is going to come along for the ride. Like there's no way you're going to be truly not anxious. And, you know, and it, you know, what's so funny is that when I finally picked my breast surgeon um, and my team, um, I had to, it was time for my imaging because I had been six months and um, they're like, hey, let's start doing your imaging here at this facility because we need to have your imaging on hand here. So I was like, okay. So I, you know, told my um, friend, you know, hey, I'm going to move on from your, you know, clinic. And, you know, he was like, definitely okay, but still give me your imaging because I still want to read it. I'm like, that's fine. Um, and I had my imaging at the new hospital, uh, the newer hospital for me. And they were using a slightly different MRI that was like, I don't know, all the radiologists are probably going to cringe as they hear this as, as me talking, but it's like, I guess the way they described it is a little bit stronger or whatever. I don't know exactly enough about MRI and the different kinds of MRI, um, but I had an MRI and I remember thinking, gosh, I got a lot, a lot more dizzier with this one. And they're like, oh, this is a different T2 or something like that. So, oh, okay, fine, whatever. Anyways, I got a call a few days later and they said, we found something. And... Um, I can't tell you how the rest of the conversation went because I think I just stopped listening. Mm -hmm. But um, I said, hey, can you, can you send me the report? And, I, and can you send me the disc images? I need the disc images, you know? So I had two of my friends, not only my breast radiologist, but another friend of mine read them. Um, and they both were like, I think this is a fibroadenoma. And that's actually what they told me, and which is a very benign lesion. But they're like, because it didn't show up on my, on my previous, and it could be just a different machine, right? Mm -hmm but you need to, you know, come back for an ultrasound. I mean, that was only a week, but the anxiety I had that week, because the thoughts that I was having were like, you waited too long. Um, see, I told you so you should have done this earlier. Yeah. You broke the promise to your mom, you know, now you're going to die. And like all these things in my brain. So I went back, it was fine. It was negative, but I actually moved, my surgery was supposed to be much later. And so I moved it up a couple of months. Um, and so so yeah, so then I had my surgery and I'll tell you, like, you know, I had read a lot of, um, I had read a lot of different stories about women who go for prophylactic mastectomy and they still find, you know, an early cancer, um, on their breast. And one of my friends, um, Dr. Thais Aliabadi, I don't know if anybody follows her story. She was one of those people. And so I had actually run into her, I was working on a TV show and she, and I had brought her in to do a segment. And um, this was in August of 19 and she had come in and um, she was like, yeah, I'm having a mastectomy next week. And I was like, what? So we talked about it a little bit. And then she called me a week afterwards and was like, Hey, I tested positive for breast cancer. And so I'm not, it's on her Instagram. I'm not sharing anything that she's not already sharing. And I think she talked and taped a documentary on it, but I remember thinking like, that's going to be me. So until I had my full mastectomy and I got that path result, that anxiety that you're talking about never went away. And now if you look at the, there, there aren't really my, my surgeon, my breast surgeon, he does a lot of these surgeries and he's been doing them since like, I don't know, 19, early 1990. And he says he hasn't for, for a prophylactic case, he hasn't had anybody that had, you know, any kind of cancer that came back later. Although um, they can never say that your chance is zero. It could just be less than 1%, you know, but you're talking about, you know, from 44% to less than 1%, I think is pretty good, you know, damn try. And if I get breast cancer, then I can at least say that I tried really hard to prevent it. Um, and, you know, the average risk for any of us women is 13%, you know, 13% of us are going to get breast cancer. And so I think for me, I don't, you know, I actually don't have anxiety around that anymore. And I just got a letter, ironically, today I opened it and it was like from my hospital going, Hey, our records indicate that you're up for your next mammogram. I'm like, no, I'm not. Cause I'm done. I'm done with that stuff. You know? 
So that super interesting. Great. That must have felt great. From the from the time that you made the decision, I'm I don't know if you can remember a day, but from the time you made the decision until the time you had your you know um, your uh, head cover on and you were getting rolled into the OR, how did you prepare for this massive change in your life? Because you know, as women, so much of our so much of our lives revolve around body image and um, you know, especially things that make us womanly, like our breasts. How did you mm -hmm. mentally prepare for? this process and what was to come and, you know, how you were going to feel going through it. And then afterwards. Yeah. I mean, I think it's so wise for you to even bring that up. And I think, um, I knew that this was going to be an issue. I suffer with really bad body, body image issues. I've been a lot more open about it over the last, um, maybe a couple months. Um, but this body image issue has really been around for about 20 years. Um, but my mom, when she went through it, she went flat. Um, I can't remember the, I, the details as to why, but she went flat and then she regretted it. And, um, uh, I completely support anybody who wants to go flat. Like, I, I just don't really know what my mom's situation was. I think maybe it was a financial decision. I'm not really exactly sure, but a couple of years later, she was really like regretting it. And so I think for me, what that taught me was like, there's a lot of body image issues with this type of surgery. It doesn't matter what you choose, what your reconstruction path is. So I decided to do the surgery. Uh, maybe about what, I mean, seriously decided to do the surgery. Like I was taking the steps, like maybe a, like a little over a year before I actually had my surgery and I hired a body image coach. Um, actually, she's not a body image coach. She's a sex coach, but I reached out to her and I was like, Hey, do you deal with body image? And he's like, she's like all day long. I was like, all right, can I, can I be your client? And I said, I'm having a mastectomy. I really don't know how to think about it or feel about it. I, I already don't like my body. So my fear is I'm going to be disfiguring my body and my breasts, um, my breasts were one of the things I liked, you know, so now I'm going to cut them off. Like, you know, so like in my head, I'm like, why, why, why would I do this? And yeah. so, um, so working with her was really a godsend. So I like, I committed that I would work with her until my surgery and then for a year after and then decide if I was okay without her or not. But um, I made that commitment to myself because I know this is going to be a journey. And, um, and I also thought that the mental aspect of this was going to be harder than the physical. Um, so I felt super prepared going into this mentally. Um, almost that I, I almost thought the physical was not going to be painful um, at all. And then like when I had my surgeon, I was like surgery and I was like, Oh my God, this actually hurts. And I'm like, why did I not think that there'd be any physical pain with it? But I had just really focused a lot on the mental aspects. And so, you know, what I think she helped me do was love my body before I even had the surgery and just come from a place that I was honoring my body, not from a place of fear or anxiety, but from a place of love and abundance of really loving my body so much. Um, and, you know, I, I think people with body image issues, and I think probably everybody has body image issues, you know? Um, but I think that um, it's probably gonna be always like a little bit of a buzzing background noise all the time. Um, but I feel at least I have a better way of managing that, that volume, you know, now. But um, I love, I love my body. I, I love it now. Like, I think I, I'm like so strong, you know? And I just went on vacation and, um, like I literally would tell anybody that asked me anything remotely close to anything health wise that I had a mastectomy. Like I was like celebrating myself. I was like, oh, I had a mastectomy. And they're like, what? Like kind of a weird <laughs> thing for a you know a stranger to be talking to you. Um, but a couple of the women we were talking in the in in a, in a jacuzzi and we were talking about. It. I was like, yeah, I just had a mastectomy. And they're like, oh my god, your implants look amazing. I'm like, girl, these are not my implants. This is my body fat. Like <laughs> I just transplanted. They're like, what? Can we do that? And I was like. Um, you know, it, it was just like, so interesting. Cause they didn't even know that this surgery existed. And so I really yeah. do love my body. Nothing. I don't physically look any different. I don't look skinnier. I don't look bigger, nothing. My surgeons did an amazing job. Um, but I, I will stress to anybody going through any type of surgery, like, especially if you have body image issues, like, please, 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 whether it's a therapist, a coach, psychiatrist, it doesn't really matter. Like whatever your avenues are that you think you need help with just get that help. Yeah. I mean, we spend our lives kind of, you know, trying to push up where it's sagging and try to, trying to suck in where it's, you know, jiggly and trying to conceal any lumps or bumps. You know, we have 
we, could, we strap ourselves into these bandages and these bras and it, always in efforts to enhance what we love and, you know, kind of distract from what we don't love. And then you go through this life altering procedure where your body comes out different. And I was, as you were speaking, thinking how, you know, how do you, how do you love yourself after, you know, when you didn't love yourself before, you know, especially when you go through something this major, and this is not just an issue, um, you know, with respect to um, mastectomy, but there are so many changes related to anyone who's going through cancer treatment um, or surgeries for, you know, like a, like a lumpectomy or a mastectomy, whether it's a unilateral, bilateral, um, that relate to body image and your, your intimacy, your sex life. You know, mm -hmm. I interviewed a woman, a uh, fabulous doctor, Mel Melanie Majoros. She's a sex therapist and she specifically coaches couples who are dealing with body image issues related to medical conditions. She specifically works with cancer patients, especially breast cancer, but that can come up with any kind of medical condition. You know, blood pressure medications can cause erectile dysfunction, you know, and there's all mm -hmm. kinds of different body image issues related to um that, that then translate into your intimate life so i think it's amazing that you incorporated a coach onto your team to help you kind of prepare for that because we can get really fixated on preparing for the pain or you know the mm -hmm. wardrobe or what we're going to do afterwards or how we're going to you know conceal and that that mindset work um you know it's probably work we all need whether or not we're having our breasts removed you know but it's i think it's really impactful and empowering that you did that work before you went through this this massive change in your life yeah and I think I just I had so much negative self-talk um you know and this stemmed way before even this idea of having a mastectomy you know I I know you recently just did um a an episode on infertility and I am an infertility patient um as well I had you know I have five kids but they were all from IVF and so even having body image issues at that time, like I'm so broken, like why am I not, I'm not as good of a woman because I'm not as fertile or whatever it may be, right? And so I think a lot of that soundtrack was still in my head, even though I had five kids to, you know, squash it, you know, but I think, you know, we go through our lives and there's traumatic things that happen to us. And sometimes we just sweep it under the rug and sometimes we don't. And I think just investigating that and loving yourself. Now, I think really, honestly, the solution to every problem and as I coach people too, is like, just love yourself. Like, are you really loving yourself? Would you say this to another human being? Like, what would you say to somebody else that's thinking this, you know? And it, we just always come, we can switch in a second of just being like, just having more empathy and more, more being more gentle, you know, and finding more options for people when it's not ourselves. So I think I'm really happy I hired a coach um, to help me. And I, and I wasn't naive to the coaching world before then. I think there's a lot of people that still think that coaching is like, like fraudulent and not needed and it's for the week and you know what if it's for the week then guess what guys I'm weak and that's okay you know but I've done a lot of really freaking amazing things and it's because I'm, I'm able to manage my mind you know and so I think this is just one of the most amazing things I've done is to give myself the strength to do to do this type of surgery and possibly break that generational trauma of losing, you know, a, a mom to cancer. Um, and I'm glad, I mean, I, I can't, I mean, I know my kids have had, know that I've had this surgery because they've seen the changes to my body, um, shield that from them. So like they got to see the drains and they got to see the incisions and they got to see all of it, um, not to traumatize them, but I just don't want to like hide it and make it like, like it's bad or it's negative. No, like, you know, mommy had to have a surgery and they remember my mom, you know, she died from breast cancer. So I explained to them. So I think for me, I'm hoping that in my daughter's generation, uh, when they're, when they're older, I have four girls. I'm hoping that we've figured out some more preventative things. I read that there's a trial for some triple negative breast cancer injection. Don't even know if that's actually where that's at or if it's even true, but I'm hoping for something like that in the future. I mean, breast cancer is one of the cancers that has a lot of funding. So I'm really hoping that it's not only towards treatment, but it's also towards possibly some genetic, I don't know, mutilation or something that kind of takes this, you know, this possibility of this going away, you know, and maybe that will open up the doors to other cancers that we can probably squash. Um, it's not the most academic discussion, but I'm just really hoping that, um, 
that we can figure this out because it's really scary to go through it. And I'm really happy that this is a fear that I don't have to, to carry with um, the rest of my life. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to talk science really. I just wanted you to be able to share your story mm-hmm. because it is a really important one. And I mean, t- you talk about, you coach on what kind of legacy you help women identify, you know, what kind of life they're living, what, how much, how authentic we are being in our own lives and how much of our true selves we're giving to ourselves, to our families and to our communities at large. And so, but you're living that work, you know, you're, you're creating a legacy um, for your children and for your family and in your mother's honor and in your father's honor, you know? And so um, I, you know, I I think it's just, you mentioned mindset, you mentioned self-love and compassion. There's so much negative input and, 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 and noise in the world that when you can go and this is so much, it's common thread that runs through this show. Almost every episode we talk about how powerful our mind is, how much control we have over it. And I mean, these are hard decisions. These are actual factual medical decisions. It's not like you could, you know, change your mindset over whether or not this is going to happen to you or this, you know, should have, uh, you should have this surgery, but your whole mindset about just the whole process, the whole process. And the fact that you are speaking and telling your story and giving the gift to your family, to your children, I'm sure that you consider that part of your legacy. <laughs> Tell me, tell me how you would guide any woman who's listening um, and who's considering either going for testing or um, who's thinking about having the procedure. What, what advice do you have for them aside from getting a, a Yeah, I think, I think the first part is, um, you know, I don't want to panic anybody. So, I mean, I think if you're listening to this, I don't want you to think that you have to go out and do something. Okay. I think for me though, I just had true risk. And for a long time, I didn't really know what to do with that risk. So I think one, if you do have high risk, you know, talk to your doctor, um, you know, they're going to know best of what to do um, for you in your situation. Um, if you feel like you're not being heard. Um, and there was many times I felt like I wasn't heard on my journey. Um, that's a whole nother podcast. Um, but there's, especially with choosing a reconstruction um, avenue, um, there was a lot of direction that I was given that wasn't really fitting the needs of what I wanted my path to be. Yeah. Um, and that's just the paternal aspect of uh, the paternalistic aspect of medicine. It's like very patriarchal and, you know, whatnot. But anyways, um, I think just if you're higher risk, you know, just talk to your doctor. I mean, you can order your own genetic testing. If you are higher risk again, you know, this information is only useful if you, you know, have a risk to generate, if you have no history of anything, you know, then these are just markers that are just going to probably cause you anxiety for no reason (laughs) in the future. Um, but you can actually go to their websites. You can order it yourself. If, um, you don't have insurance, I I didn't use insurance. It was $200 for me. Just want to let you know, I think it was 200 or $250, which is much cheaper than I know the, the BRCA testing was in the time that you did it. Um, and uh, I think they have like also financial plans for people who, who may need it. Um, and they have like, for, you know, some um, gifted, you know, kind of samples and things like that, that they do. Um, so one is, you know, don't be scared of the data. You know, I think if you, if you are higher risk, get the data, find out if you are truly higher risk, even if you test negative for all of these things, like, for example, what if I tested negative for check two, what would have been my next step? Well, I would still pursue trying to find out how to get a mastectomy, um, you know? And so I think that, you know, you just have to have the data in front of you, whether that's your family history, whether that's genetics or whatever it may be. And then I think like at that point, just know your options. Like it is super scary to hear all your options, but I think just get all your options out there. And so one of the pieces of advice that I got, uh, which was really helpful is, you know, make, I, I always tell people, you know, get three consults. I say that, I say that with IVF, like, Hey, just get three consults, get like your dream place that you think you can't afford to go to the place that's local. And then somewhere in between, you know, get your three consults and just see what they're all saying. If they're all saying the same thing, then you can make a business decision from that point of what's the best financially for you and logistically for you and stuff like that. So I started taking my own advice and going, well, let me just get three consults. And then it was like, wait, let me get three more. Let me get three more because I started figuring out the, the reconstruction path is very stylistic. And I, I started kind of understanding a little bit more about like the business aspect of medicine and what surgeons can do certain surgeries and what surgeons can't do certain surgeries. And so it took me a while to find out the right people to consult for my situation. Um, but 
I think that not being scared of getting that information. And so one of the things that the pieces of advice that my coach gave me, as I started saying earlier, was every time I would go to a consult, I would walk out and I literally write down everything that I remembered that they said, um, because it can get very confusing. You talk to a whole bunch of doctors and then, you know, you're like, I don't remember what he said, but she said this and whatever it may be. And then at some point I put like an end date and I was like, this is where my discovery ends, you know? Um, you know, I did discovery from December to March and I was like, okay, when it's the anniversary of my mom's death in March, I'm going to make a decision. Who's my breast surgeon and who is my plastic surgeon. And I made that decision. I was honoring my, you know, timeline and I made my decision and I moved forward. Um, so I think, I mean, that's my advice. That's how I did it is really just, you know, don't be scared, get the, get the information and then make your decision. And even if your decision is that I'm not going to do a surgery, that's fine too. But I think just, you know, taking that process and making sure that you have control of the, over those decisions, I think is like really important. Um, but I'll say like, take a step back from that. Like even just learning from my mom and from a lot of people that have gone through this path, like, and it's really hard to say this to women because like there's so much patriarchy. Um, so I know you will hear me, but I don't know if it will really be heard <laughs> is like, you are worth it. Like you are worth every step of this um, of this path, like you are worth investigating your life. You are worth investigating what the options are that you have for yourself. Um, and I think that a lot of us, I mean, there are studies that show that by the age of eight girls think that they're not as worth as much as boys, you know? Um, and just because we became doctors or just because you're listening to this podcast, um, or a YouTube channel and you are being like that, that's not me. I mean, think about one thing that you withhold on because it's either too much money for yourself or whatever it may be. And, yeah. and you will find things that you are depriving yourself of. And I mean, I can give tons of examples of this in my life. And I know if I'm doing it, then, yeah. you know, like, you know, other people are doing it. Um, so I think it's just knowing that, you know, you are worth investment. You are worth saving. You are worth you know, doing all the screenings for you are worth all of that. Um, so whether that's you're putting off your mammogram because you're like, oh, I don't have time, the kids and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, or I don't have insurance right now. I might not be able to afford it. Well, there's free mammograms. You know, there's a lot of things out there, but if you're in your own mindset about, you know, oh, I, I don't have access to the stuff, at least state that and let people help you find the access to that stuff. I agree that we have a lot of barriers to healthcare. We have a lot of barriers to a lot of access to resources. I'm not saying that, but if you just tell the right people that you need help, people want to genuinely help you. And I'm one of those people. I mean, I want to help you listening, but I also, I was the person who needed help and I didn't know where to go. And so I started off by, you know, asking the people, my friends that were breast surgeons, my friends who are breast radiologists, like, Hey, what would you do in this situation? you know, and then they, they help me. And, and I think all of you guys probably have friends too. So, um, so just know you're worth it. Don't let your fear paralyze you. Don't let your anxiety paralyze you get the facts and then make a business decision off of it. Like, as if you're just, you know, not an emotional one, just a business decision, like what's right for me. It was, you know, this statistic is a little too high for me. I'm not comfortable. I got to do it. And then you know, there was a lot of other things that came up like, oh my gosh, how am I going to afford this? How could I take time off work? All these things. Right. Sure. And so then I got to work through all of those problems. My beautiful brain offered me right after, you know, it was like freaking out, like who's going to take care of the kids? You know, how are the kids going to handle this? Is this, this going to traumatize them? How's this going to affect my sex life? Is my husband going to truly be okay with it? Am I going to end up in divorce? Like all these things came up in my brain, but then I got to actually address it and not wait until I had cancer for me to address the same problems. Yeah you know, yeah. at that time. So that's a long-winded answer, but that's my answer. So if um, anybody ever has any questions about this, I mean, obviously both you and I probably answer them or, you know, please go to your doctor and answer to get the no. answer. The, the long-winded answer was so perfect because you brought up so many, so many valuable points. First of all, you and I both see, I work in hospital medicine, you work in emergency medicine, and we both see the unfortunate case of the person who comes in and it's too late for everything because they didn't take care of themselves. And on the other hand, you and I are both educators. We are both in the space where we want to, you know, I think all doctors want to teach and want to educate people about what you should do and you could do to potentially help yourself save your life, improve your quality of life. 
Um, but it's a great point, first of all, that you bring up that, you know, just don't delay all of the things, all of the things that we recommend screening for your yearly physical, your, your cholesterol level, your mammogram, your colonoscopy, there, there's science and research behind that. You know, we're not just trying to, you know, send you for unnecessary testing. We know that they, they do help to determine what the next steps are. They can be life-saving. So the fact that you just kind of, I, I pointed out that, um, you know, you're worth, you're worth investing in yourself. You're worth in, in exercising and you're worth eating a healthy diet and you're worth you know, pursuing your hobbies and your friendships and your relationships and um, your intimate life. These are all things that are important that make you whole and human. And um, I think that far too many people, uh, especially with telemedicine these days, which I love, um, but far too many people don't have uh, a, a, a established relationship with a primary care doctor who can help them who can talk them through, who can help them make decisions, who can say, hey, you need to get your mammogram, you know, kind of nudge you along if you're not taking care of yourself as well as you should be. So that's the first thing that you mentioned. The second thing is that, you know, I've been in your shoes as well. It's a different podcast and different story, but um, you mentioned that, you know, we know, we have friends in every specialty. You, you're, you, like you said yourself, you're one of the most connected physicians that you know, you could probably call any one of your friends on speed dial and have um, information or access to medical care immediately. And most people don't have that. So I can't imagine how difficult it might be for people who, who it was so difficult for you to get information to make a decision. It took such a long time and get the information that you needed even, connect, even as connected as you are, that, you know, that just goes to show that just j people who are not in the medical field, um, it, it might be just as difficult and it might take a long time. But like you said, there are so many people who are out there who are willing to help you. The other thing that you mentioned that I loved was you talk about, you know, if you're not feeling heard, one of the things we talk about a lot is, you know, you need to connect with and work with a physician team that their approach is in line with your goals for your own body. If you're going up against a physician who is, you know, um, who is giving you directives and maybe not letting you participate in the conversation or someone who is holistic when you want more evidence-based, you know, you're both gonna end up frustrated. So, so, so interviewing and going and getting a couple of opinions to find somebody who really is a good fit and can really help, you know, hold your hand through this um, is of utmost importance. And I just wanna say, you know, before we wrap things up that, I, you know, I think your mom would be so proud that you are living her legacy, that you are not only that you fulfilled her wish um, for your for for your health, but that you're living, you know, in in her um, likeness as a mom and as a woman and that you're doing all the things that you want to do and are capable of doing you you are the creator you are the the founder you are the doctor you're the coach you're the mom you're the wife um, and so I think that she would be really proud of you so I will be sending um, all of my loving energy into the world for Noha and I will say her name with my family in her honor thank you so much for being here before you go I just want you, you to please let my friends know of course please let my friends who are listening know where they can find you if they want to reach out if they want to follow your story I think you provide so much valuable information on your social media um, or if they want to work with you as a coach yeah so um so I'm on a lot of social media channels so basically if you just google my name Hala Sabri um I'm everywhere and I, I can give you links for that but on Facebook I'm uh, Dr. Hala Sabri same with TikTok and on Instagram, although I'm more on Facebook and TikTok um, than anything else. I do, I do coach individuals, but I do want to make a disclaimer. I don't coach on like body. Im I, I do coach on body image, but I don't coach on like mastectomy personally or anything like that. So I think, um, but I, I, I do focus on mid-career women who want to create legacy. And that can look like in different ways. Like for me, it was, you know, making sure I'm, I'm around long enough to even have impact. But, you know, I'm all about innovation and recreating, um, you know, kind of myself and my, and my career. And I've done a lot in my career. And so for the women who are just kind of pausing and thinking like, you know, why am I doing all of this? Like I'm a high powered woman and I've already broken the glass ceiling you know, in my family. Um, but now what, you know, and I feel like I'm living on cruise control and I feel like, you know, why am I doing all the things? Like, that's really what I coach on. Um, but if you ever have a question about mastectomy, obviously I will answer everything. I answer every DM that I get that I see. Um, but, um, and I can always like help you find, you know, a body image coach. I do coach on body image, but it's not my niche. Um, it, but it comes up in so many different ways. But find me. If you have any questions, find me. If I can't help you, I will help you find the person who can help you, um, you know, because I'm, I'm pretty well connected. So 
thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Oh my gosh. I'm so grateful that I'm so grateful that we finally got to meet. I'm so grateful that yeah. you shared your story. And um, I know that so many people will, uh, will appreciate the information and advice that you've given us. Go follow Dr. Hala Sabri on social media. And I mean, her story is incredible. She's an incredible human. And I'm just, I just feel lucky to know you and have met you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Bye. Bye.